Uh, Father, <laughs> Lord, we come to you, God, and we, uh, we thank you for the family we have here, Lord, and that we can just be, have fun and, and, and laugh and enjoy, but Lord, we want to get in your word and talk about a serious topic, and that's marriage, uh, divorce, remarriage, uh, things, God, that you talked about, Jesus, and we just pray, Lord, that, that you would open up our eyes to these topics that are very relevant for us today, Lord, and, and what you say marriage should be, Father, and so I pray for <clears throat> each one of us that down the road might be looking at getting married or in a marriage, Lord, that we'd take your words and we'd apply it to our lives, Father. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, uh, we're going to be in chapter 19, and as you see, we're going to be talking about, we're going to hit 1 through 12, but this morning we're just going to hit the first six verses. But these six, these passages talk about divorce, marriage, and remarriage, so read all the way through uh, this week to get it on through. But let's go and open up in verse 1, uh, chapter 19 of the Gospel of Matthew. It says, that it came to pass when Jesus had finished these saying that he now departed from Galilee, and he came to the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. Jesus is now finished with his ministry there in Galilee. He's now going to be heading south. He's now going to be going to Jerusalem. We're in the last few months of Jesus' life here, and he's traveling on the eastern side of the Jordan, which we call Jordan today. And great multitude follows him, and he heals them all. We see that as Jesus heads down south, his popularity is still huge with those people down in the area of Judea. And the power of Jesus is also being used as he's healing many people, and a multitude is following him. And when he gets down there and he's traveling on down, he comes against the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, it says in verse 3, they come to Jesus also. So besides this multitude, he's healing people. We have the Pharisees coming to him. And it says, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? It says that they're they're coming and they're asking this question. The word testing him means to test him, to try him in a very malicious sense. They want to trap Jesus, and this is nothing new. When Jesus was in Galilee, as we read through the Gospel of Matthew, several times the Pharisees came up and approached Jesus with an attempt to trap him, to trip him up. We read in Matthew 9, 11, the Pharisees say, why does your, ask his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners, being critical of him? In verse 14, why do the Pharisees fast often, they ask Jesus, but your disciples aren't fasting. They start making destructive statements against Jesus, trying to trap him. In verse 34 of Matthew 9, we read, it says, and he casts out demons, accusing Jesus of doing this by what? The ruler of demons. On 12, 2, it says, look, your disciples are doing something which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So the Pharisees were constantly coming against Jesus till we finally read in verse 14 of chapter 12, then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him, against him to do what? How they might destroy him. They're now looking <clears throat> at killing Jesus and Jesus is leaving Galilee. Got a reason. They came up from Jerusalem and Judea up to Galilee to do all this. Now Jesus is heading south, and now he's going into actually Pharisee territory. And the attacks we're going to find out are going to continue until ultimately we know that they are going to go and, and have Jesus executed. Now they're asking this question of Jesus not to gain knowledge. They're not asking Jesus the rabbi to give them new information so that they are enlightened by it. But they're asking him to trap him. And so they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reasons? In other words, is it lawful, not according to Roman law, but according to what? The Mosaic law. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reasons? They're asking him a scriptural question, legality based upon Mosaic law. Now, they both, Jesus knew, and the, and, and the Pharisees knew what Mosaic law stated. It says in Deuteronomy 24.1 that when a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her. And the big word I want you to focus on is uncleanness. 
And he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. And so the question is, you know, can he do this for just any reason? And the reason is at first century uh, BC, there are two school of thoughts. One is called the school of Halil and the school of Shemiah. And this was how they looked at the word uncleanness. The school of Shemiah said that in this word uncleanness meant sexual immorality. A man may only divorce his wife for adultery, sex outside of the bounds of marriage. Very strict view. This was a very unpopular view because it, it limited what a guy can do to get rid of a woman. The school of Hillel held that uncleanness meant any sort of indiscretion. It allowed for divorce for even trivial offenses. You burned your husband's meal, or the wife's beauty is fading, or too much salt on, on her husband's egg. It caused him to lose his temper, to make him sin, therefore she is unclean. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that is what they, in fact, most people uh, enjoyed that, and this was actually the one being taught by many of the Pharisees. And so, the question is around those four words, for just any reason. See, they're trying to trap Jesus and saying, do you agree with this school of thought or do you agree with this school of thought? If you agree with this school of thought and take it very restrictive, then we're going to say the people don't like this. If you take this full of school of thought and thought it was very open and wide like, like they were teaching, then they're saying you're not taking God's word seriously. They're trying to trick Jesus and trap Jesus. <clears throat> and I love the answer. The answer to the question in these first verses he gives them has nothing to do with divorce. It has everything to do with marriage. In other words, Jesus' answer about divorce, he focuses first on what? The institution of marriage. It says in verse 4 through 6, And he answered them and said, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then there are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. <clears throat> They're going to ask him again in verse 7, why did Moses then give them a writ? And he's going to talk about divorce, and he's going to talk about remarriage in verses 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. But I like how he initially doesn't even talk about it. So that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about marriage, what I call God's blueprint for marriage. Because the emphasis all the way through is on marriage, not on divorce. And it's a wise approach that if, if, if you have any concerns of what's happening in somebody's life or in your life regarding the relationship, I would encourage you to have them focus on what? Marriage. On the institution of marriage, of staying together. Through this, when, when, when people are going through pre, uh, going to get married, and they ask me to perform a marriage, I say, I want you to go through premarital counseling. And the reason why I want you to do that is because I want you to talk and look at what marriage is according to what? God's word. And so, you know, those of you in high school, those of you in college, or you haven't been married and you haven't done this, or you, 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 maybe you're divorced, maybe you're in a situation, you're thinking about it. I want you to look at what marriage is says it has to be, what God says it has to be, what Jesus says it has to be. And if you are married, I want you to look this morning and say, where am I with this marriage? Where am I with this leaving and cleaving and this becoming one flesh that you're talking about, that Jesus talked about? I like that. Before we even talk about divorce, let's focus on marriage. Many times people will come to me like the Pharisees and they say, Brad, what can I do to scripturally and legally get out of my marriage? Versus Brad, what can I do to honor the vows that I made to my spouse and to God in my marriage? Two different perceptions of people coming up, right? I'm having a hard time. I'm having some difficult times. But Brad, I want you to know, what are some things we can do to make sure that I stay in that place where God can do to honor my vows? That's what we're going to look about. You've got to look at the very end. The last verse 6 says, Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Who is the one who joins man and woman together in marriage? It's what? It's God. What God has joined together. You see, it's a covenant that you're making with each other and with God. It's God who instituted marriage. And since he created marriage, only his rules apply to marriage. And so we go back at verse 4, and he said to them, Have you not read that who made them in the beginning made them male 
and female. Jesus is now talking about the origin of marriage, the very first marriage, the marriage between the male and the female, Adam and Eve. And he says, have you not read? Kind of a shot to them because the Pharisees hopefully have read all this, right? They teach this stuff. That's what a Pharisee does. And he says, he's reading going back to Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Jesus is saying, let's go back to a historical a moment, historical event that happened. And that historical event is not a myth. It is not a fable. It's truth. There was an Adam and there was an Eve. It's not something like like. People believe, it's amazing, I just heard a statistic, like, like 67% of churches now are looking at the first 12 chapters of, of, of Genesis being total fictitious and myth- mythological. If you weren't here, when we went through Genesis and all the scientific evidence that supports that, I would encourage you to listen, go on YouTube and listen to the teachings, because it just talks about it and validating that all this has been a historical event. But in referring to Genesis 127, Jesus is indicating that marriage is only between a male and a female. Never did I ever think that we have to clarify what that means. You got two X's in your genetic, you are a female. You got an XY, you're a male. Not hard, not too difficult. It it really isn't that difficult. Jesus teaches that God created humanity, male and female, in his image, in his likeness. We are divinely separated into male and female. We are not the same. Just check the emotions in the home. Check the anatomy. Women are so special that they would know men aren't tough enough to have children. Only women are. And God created women to have, have children, not men. Men are too wimpy. Right, women? God made us different. Women speak pink, men speak blue. Women are like waffles. Everything is an independent event, not connected to the other. Women, they're like spaghetti. Everything's intertwined. You get to the end of the day, hey, baby, you want to, you know, spend some time? What do you mean? Why are we talking about what I did this morning? Because everything is what? Connected. And women, guys just don't get it. We're stupid. We, we don't. We're just, whoa, 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 whoa. let's talk about this wall for Ah, we're talking about spaghetti. Everything's connected. So guys, realize everything's connected, right? Dwell with your wives according to what? Knowledge. And live with them in that. But we're different this morning. God made us differently. And Jesus now states that God has authority over male, over the marriage. And he made us male and female. When he talks about uh, wife, the word wife is very gender specific. It cannot mean anything else than a woman. There is no passage in, in Scripture where marriage ever involves anything but a man and a woman. Marriage is between Adam and Eve. It's not between Adam and Steve. I mean that, I mean that very seriously. God says homosexuality is a sin. Here's a Scripture, and, 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 and you got your, I, I don't know, it's, may not have put that in your, in your uh, bulletins, but here, I'd write this down. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit what? The kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. But it continues. Thieves, or covetous, or drunkards, or revilers, or extortioners, none of them are going to inherit what? The kingdom of heaven. And then I love verse 11. It says, but such what? were some of you. We might have been out there in this lifestyle, but God, you know, we're not, we're not born and we're born sinners, but God says that you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. And so man may say that, that the laws allow same-sex people to be married. God says it is something else, but it's definitely not marriage. Marriage is only between what? A male and a female. That's not too... I, why are you even emphasizing? Why do I have to emphasize this? Because our culture is saying otherwise. For a man and a woman to have sexual relationship before their marriage is called fornication, and it is a sin. 
For a man to be joined to another man, it is not marriage. It is sodomy, and it is a sin. For a woman to be married to another woman, it is not marriage. It is homosexuality, and it is a sin. For a man to be joined to more than one woman is not marriage. It is polygamy, and it is a sin. For a man and a woman to be believing, to be, excuse me, to be living together, having sexual relationships outside of marriage, is not marriage. It is fornication. It is a sin. For a married man or a married woman to have a sexual relationship outside of their marriage, it is adultery. It is a sin. And God says, do not be deceived. Why? Because we live in a culture that's amazing how many people are what? Deceived. Those people that are living their life in that lifestyle, that are, and there's no repentance, they're living in that lifestyle, as much as drunkards and revilers and extortioners, you will not enter the kingdom of God. That's what God's word says. See, we have a higher authority than our government. It's God's word. And regardless of what our government says marriage is, Jesus says marriage is only between a male and a female. Is that clear? Real clear, that's God's word. <clears throat> then in verse 5, Jesus said, Therefore, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined or cleaved to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but are what? One. This is God's blueprint for a marriage. It involves leaving. It involves cleaving. It's evolving, becoming one flesh. Three steps. That's involved. And I'm going to talk about those three steps this morning. The word leave, it says, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. The word leave is a pretty radical word. It means to depart from, to leave behind, to abandon. What does it say, that the man shall leave or the woman shall leave? The man shall leave his mother and father. The man. See, spiritual leadership will always begin with the men every single time. It shows you that the parent-child relationship is very important in children you are to subordinate to your parents. It's a temporary one that will involve leaving that, that inner circle, I'm going to call it, and you'll see why, to start your own relationship. And that's when I bring up this inner circles issue. When a husband and wife are joined together, that becomes one whole new inner circle. And if they have children, then that's all part of this inner circle. Now, God has the husband as the one to one to make sure this inner circle is protected. Protected from what? The outside influences, which includes family, in-laws, outlaws, acquaintances, cousins, close friends, whatever it might be. Sorry about the outlaw joke. It involves those people that might want to start getting involved in your relationship at this time. I call it the refrigerator clause. In my home, raising my kids and my family, if you felt comfortable to open the refrigerator, make yourself a sandwich, get yourself a cook, do whatever, you're probably part of the inner circle. My mom never would go into my, wouldn't think about opening my fridge. I, would, I don't think about going to my, 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 my daughter's house and just opening it and taking out a frying pan and start cooking something up, right? However, the kids don't. Kids have no problem. In fact, they'll complain if you don't have what they want in the fridge. And because that's part of what? the inner circle. And so it says, husbands, you have to leave your family. You have to leave your father, leave your mother, and cleave to your wife. And that's one of the ones, upon a marriage, it must be the man who's doing this to start his new inner circle. Pop up the next slide. <clears throat> so your wife is part of one inner circle, and your husband's part of one inner circle, but you both need to leave and start your new what? Inner circle. And you need to cut that Every single time, I have seen uh, men's mothers meddle in their son's marriage at the frustration of the new bride. And they do this, I'm going to assume, very well-intended. It's been their baby. That's her boy. You know, my mom always hemmed my pants. So when I had to have my pants hemmed, I'd go to my mom and ask her to hem my pants did that one time, because then my lovely bride said, hey, I'm happy to hem your pants. Yeah, but my mom always hem my pants. Not anymore. <laughs> That's when we had long Levi's. I never, I'm not going to go there. <clears throat> 
I do not ask my wife to go and tell my mom that she's not going to be hemming my pants anymore. That's the wuss way out. And what's going to happen is you're going to cause tension between your bride and what? Your mom. The guy's got to pull out the scissors and cut the umbilical cord that's still connected to mom because she's going to want to pull you back, and you got to cut it off. I had to call my mom and say, Hi, Mom, thanks very much, but Angela's going to take care of that. She's going to be the one who's going to do this. See, <clears throat> God gave me a wife. He didn't give me a mom. And she's the new woman in my life. And i got to make sure that doesn't happen. And by me doing that, it stopped any type of this happening there. God didn't take one of Adam's rib and make him a mother. God took one of Adam's rib and made him a wife, one comparable to him. Our married, <clears throat> once married, our response to our parents is not of dependence, but rather independence. There has to be an emotional independence, a financial independence from your parents. And many times this is where marriages crash. The husband allows these dependencies to continue. If you allow financial dependency, what happens, you're going to have strings attached. If you allow emotional dependency to continue, then your heart's not free to engage and connect and to, with each other. And the man must leave and protect the family, the inner circle, from outside influences, which many times is our own parents. But that doesn't mean you ignore your parents or don't spend time with your parents. Of course you do. But leaving your parents means you recognize that your marriage now creates a brand new entity, a brand new oneness. And that has to have a higher priority than the previous family that you were a child of. So after you leave, what's the next thing? It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined or cleaved to his wife. The word to be joined or cleaved, depending on what uh, version you have reading, <clears throat> it means to adhere to, to glue to, to join with, to pursue after. <clears throat> it's like taking monster glue and fusing two pieces of wood together that when you something breaks, they won't break on where they were fused together. <clears throat> we just made these railings all the way around for the ramp, right? And the new one's there. They take these pipes and they cut them at angles and then they weld them together and grind. And I can't tell where, where one seam starts and the other seam stops. And it's not going to break. It's just now what? It's all one new structure fused together. And that's what this means in this leaving and this cleaving. <clears throat> Verse 6 says, So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. Guys, this cleaving together, this joining together into one flesh is by God himself. It's intended to be a permanent bond, never to be separated when a man and a woman make a commitment in marriage, they make a covenant with God, they make a covenant with each other, a promise to each other, and they normally do this in their vows, and what they say is what? Until death do us part. Now, that doesn't give you right to kill your spouse to get out of the thing, all right? That, all right? It means you're making this commitment to be with your spouse, what? Forever, until one of you pass away. That's a value you're making. And it's amazing, <clears throat> I've never been with a couple, I have never done a council where, where, where we look at the vows and they say, nah, that's too heavy for me. Nah, that's too, uh, I don't know. Let's write when love leaves. What's the love? Love's a commitment. Love's, love, love's a choice you make. But I don't want to make that choice. When I, you know what I mean? I made this for life. You got to realize you're making this for life is what God's word says. Never to be separated. Let not man separate till death do us part. It's an unbreakable lifelong union. You don't quit when things are going hard. It means you stick together. You continue to pursue each other. So often we think of that oneness is, is, is become one flesh has to do with fleshly sexual intimacy. And it does include sexual flesh, fleshly intimacy but it includes much more because <clears throat> there's intimacy beyond just fleshly intimacy. We are created a triune being. And as a triune being, pop that slide up there, we are body, soul, and spirit. Animals are body, soul, but there's no spirit. When God made the animals, he was all done. Then he made Adam, totally separate. The body is how we relate through the experience of the five senses. 
how we relate to those around us and the choices we make involve the mind, the will, the emotions, my thinks, my, what, what I want to do, where do I want to go, all that processes within my, my soul. And my spirit is how we relate to God. We've got to realize that when the Lord made man, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became spiritually alive, a living being. Next slide. And with that living being, you've got to realize <clears throat> you now are communing with God. They're walking with God. And the spirit is making all these choices, impacting the soul. God, what do you want me to do? Lord, what does it do for my life? And the soul helps us make all these decisions. And that continued until when? Until Satan came and deceived the woman and they ate of the, the apple and they died what? Spiritually. No longer communing with God. And now the influence over the soul, the decisions we make as an unsaved person, spiritually dead, is my flesh, my body, my selfishness, what I want, where I want it. And that's why the world out there today, you see, is just focused on me, myself, and I, what they call their holy trinity, their rights, what they want. And if you respect what they want, you hear what I'm saying? Then you're wrong, you're bad. It's all about the self-centeredness because they're spiritually dead at that time. And that's why Jesus told the great Jewish leader Nicodemus in John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the what? Spirit is spirit. And Nicodemus, you're a great religious leader, but do not marvel, I said to you this. Nicodemus, you what? Must be born again. You mean you can have a religious leader not born again? You sure can. There are a lot of them out there filling the pulpits. And they are spiritually dead. And so when you, when you say, Lord Jesus, I, I want to give you my life, I want you to be my Lord and Savior, I believe in you, then you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, once again, as a born-again believer, the Holy Spirit fills your life and once again influences you, and you are a spiritual being. Again, you're spiritually alive. And not only do you see things, you got to realize the flesh involves these senses that has to do with the, the, my body. But the Spirit has everything to do with my spirit. And I see heaven, and I desire heaven. I desire what God wants for my life. And God starts speaking to me, and I start communing to me, and I start communing to God. And the way I speak to God is through prayer, and the way that God speaks to me is through his word. And as a result, I get this relationship, because communication is everything in a relationship. You talking to God and sharing with God and, and doing that is important, but you listening to God and getting into his word is as important, because it's a two-way process as communicating with each other is what? A two-way process. It's not a monologue. You know, I'm not listening to you. You know what I mean? It's a dialogue. Oh, I heard you say. Oh, are you feeling this? Oh, it's this process of listening to each other. <clears throat> and I wrote, the greatest thing you can ever bring into your, to God and to your relationship and to a marriage is a spirit-filled relationship with God. So the next slide shows you that when people look at getting married and, 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 and talking, the first thing I say is, is, where are you with the Lord? After I get to know them, where is Christ in your life? Are you born again? Have you received him as your Lord and Savior? If you're a Christian, do not be unequally yoked with a what? Unbeliever. Why? Because you're spiritually alive and they're spiritually dead. You're not even going to be talking the same language. Forget the blue and the pink. We're talking about spiritual things that matter. Yet when you're both born again, then all of a sudden you now bring that to God. <clears throat> See, a spiritual believer, you can be open with God, naked before the Lord, and with your soul, not just physically, but with your soul, with your spirit. You can talk to God about your emotions, your hurts, your heartaches, your dreams, your, your frustrations, ask God for wisdom. Come to God and just bear who you are. In fact, some people will bear with God more with them than with their spouse. But God wants us to. He already knows who I am. And I can do that with my, with my spirit. I can come to the Lord and say, God, I want to know what you want, Lord. I, I want what you will. Do that work within my life. I can pray daily like Psalm 51, 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit with me. And he does. And through the power of the spirit working into my soul, he changes me how? From the inside what? Out. Not the outside. Not externally. He changes me, my heart, my thoughts. See, <clears throat> When man realizes that 
a woman that God brings to him is a gift from God, that this bride is an equal triune being, and that he's created perfectly for him to accomplish what God has for them, prepared them to do, it's a joyous thing. And that's what it is. And that's what Adam and Eve brought to God every single day until they fell. God, that's what God desires for us to bring into a marriage. You see, it says in verse 6, and the two shall now become one flesh, and then there shall be no longer two but one flesh. The word flesh has to do with a body, one unit, which is body, soul, and spirit. You're now unified in all three areas. You're connected in a way, super glued together into one entity until death do you part. Marriage is a cleaving of a spirit-filled man and a spirit-filled woman becoming one new body, one new permanent relationship between a husband and a wife into a God-designed and God-purposed life. That doesn't mean that you can't have relationships and friendships. Sure you can. But what it means is that cleaving is I'm going to give up my selfishness. I'm going to give up what's best for me versus what's best for what? Us and what we're doing. So it involves dying to self. It involves all those different areas and coming together because you're no longer separate entities but one new entity. And I put this triangle on this. And I do this and I say, this is you. And this is you desiring to have oneness, a one relationship with God in body, soul, and spirit where you're seeking his desire for your life and what you should do. And here's the woman. And the woman also is seeking for this relationship. But they also have to have this oneness with what? each other. And truly, as you get closer to the Lord and this person gets closer to the Lord, you will naturally get what? Closer to each other. And that happens so much. And what happens though, <clears throat> many times is people are, have no problem being open and naked in this area. Their body and the flesh and intimacy there. And you know what? They never move into an intimacy of what? The souls and my heart and my wills. Well, I don't want to tell them what I'm thinking. If I tell them what I'm thinking, if I tell them what my goals are, my dreams are, they're, they're not going to love me. They're not going to accept me. They're going to get to know the real me. Then you limit the amount of intimacy you're going to have in a relationship because intimacy is far more than physical intimacy. Intimacy is being open and honest and naked before the person and sharing who you are and knowing that person is going to love you and care about you. And then you get the spiritual intimacy of, 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 of both being selfless and other-centered and getting grace, not judgment. You see, that's what's involved. God's in the middle of every aspect of your life. <clears throat> I use this scripture at many of my, my ceremonies. It says in Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered by another and two can withstand him, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. <clears throat> they use the, the candles of lighting, one unity candle, they use the sand mixing it together, or use, you know, weaving the three ropes together, but that's what it's involved. <clears throat> it's not quickly broken. You know, it's not going to be broken by God, that's for sure. It'll be broken by one of the strands breaking and not breaking their covenant and commitment that they made. <clears throat> you see, when, when Christ, and you're walking with the Lord, you're like Adam and Eve, and it says in Genesis 2.25, and they were both naked, and man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. When did Adam and Eve cover themselves with leaves? After the fall, after the fall, they were ashamed, they were guilt, and they tried to hide to God, and they thought God was going to be mad at them. And why do we hide ourselves? Why do we put things and cover our hearts and how we're thinking and what we're doing? Many times because we're what? We're ashamed. We're guilty. If I share this about myself, they're not going to love me. They're going to hold back feelings. Because there's some ugliness in me. There's some areas of sin in me. And rather than going to your spouse and saying, I'm struggling in this area. I'm having a hard time in this area. I'm feeling this resentment towards you in this area. I'm having this. And communicating with each other in an area, hopefully, that's going to be non judgmental, but grace giving. And say, Can we come together and hold hands? Can we pray for each other? Will you pray for me? Because I'm struggling in this area. I'm having a hard time in this area. And I feel like Satan's getting a victory in this area. And you're my soulmate. You're the one that God gave me to come to, to pray together. Will you pray for me? And I'm sure the person's going to say, Lord willing, yes, yes. You're doing what? You're thinking what? Are you doing that? Grace, grace, grace. Unashamed, 
total openness, this oneness, total acceptance and intimacy. I wrote down, in our God's blueprint for marriage, it has an honest relationship. Honest in that you can be open and honest in your communication. It's a priority. You want to hear what the other person says. They want to hear what you say. You're vulnerable. Vulnerable means you've got a safe setting and environment that you can share with each other. A completing relationship. You want to help the other person. You want to support the other person to grow and to be the godly man and woman that God desires. It's an accepting relationship. It's not judgmental. It's grace-giving. I'm going to say it again. It's grace-giving. It's grace-giving. We need to give grace to each other. It's, not, it's, it's easy to be judgmental enough. I know you're going to be judgmental with me. I'm not going to share it with you. I won't share it with you. I'll just what? Close up. The moment I share, you jump on me. You know what I'm going to do next time? No more. I'm just going to hold it. Or, or, or am I getting closer? Because last time I shared it with you, you bit my head off. Well, I'm sorry. Okay, let's, let's, let's go forward. See, where are we going to go today? Where are we going to go? It's an affirming relationship, emotionally supporting each other, encouraging, and it's a praying relationship. You are praying, helping each other. Many times, there are times in our lives where we will just get on our knees or on our bed or by the couch and just hold each other's hands and just pray, Lord, we're having a hard time. We're struggling with some areas. We, God, we ask you, we seek you. Lord, we don't understand why things are happening. We're confused, Lord. But God, we want to make sure that we're not divided, that we're together with each other, that we're moving forward as one flesh and one mind and one spirit in this whole situation. It's about being other-centered and grace-giving, letting God's unconditional love, unconditional love, his agape love, flow through our lives accepting each other. We're going to have communion. Do you know that the marriage <clears throat> is intended to reflect our relationship with Christ, the bride of Christ with Christ? It's intended to be a light that when people see our relationship, they understand the love and the grace that the husband has towards the wife and the same thing that that. Christ has for you and I. That's what it's supposed to be a picture of. So can I have Buddy and Chris? And Chris, both Chris's and Rich, come on up. And this is going to be a time where we're going to participate in the sacraments. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, <clears throat> then I don't want you to participate in the sacraments because they're intended to do, to remember what he's what, done for us. But I'd like to give you an opportunity to accept the Lord if you'd like to, to say, Lord, I've been missing this the whole time, God. I've never, I've never been in the point where I realize that, that I must be born again, that I'm spiritually dead and lost with you. So let's pray. Father, we come to you, Lord, and we pray, Father. Lord, if there's anybody here who's never said, Lord, I, I didn't recognize I was spiritually dead. I didn't recognize I, <clears throat> I need you to be in my life, that I must be born again. I'm trying to do everything on the outside, but not on the inside. I need to give my life to you. If there's anyone here that wants to say, Lord Jesus, come and be my Lord and Savior, and you've never done this, lift your hand up. Is there anyone here this morning? Thank you. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Is there anybody else? If you're watching online, say, Lord, come into my heart, and he will come and, and commune with you. But there might be some people here, maybe watching, that might have some struggles in their life. Maybe some hardship. Maybe some areas of sin or unconfessed. Maybe some areas of their marriage you want prayer. Maybe just an unspoken. But you want us to pray for you. Just lift up your hand. God, you see the hands. You see their knees, Lord. You see the unspokens, Father. So, God, we come to you, Lord. <clears throat> we desire your will. Father, not our will. We desire the power of your spirit in our lives. We desire your wisdom, not the wisdom of the world in these areas, Father. Help us die to our selfishness. Help us die to our flesh and live by the power of your spirit to love and to care, Father. Do that work, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and pass out the sacraments, guys.
Did we miss anybody? But you raise your hand. There's a three seconds to make. Buddy, can you go back and take both of them for a three seconds? On the other side, this side. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you. As I was praying, I was thinking of uh, of just uh, what Jesus was written uh, in Ephesians 5. It says, Husbands, love your wives as what? Christ loves the church. You know, when we see Jesus taking the bread and breaking it and passing it out and says, Take and eat, this is given to you, this has been my, my body given to you, do this in remembrance of me. And it's referring to Christ giving his life, everything. And, you know, I was just sitting there thinking, Jesus literally died to every aspect of self. He died. He, Jesus really was grace-giving. He was other-centered. And when I say, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church, what did, what did Jesus withhold? He gave everything. Husband, I encourage you to love your wives as Christ loves the church. It starts with the men leading the home and doing that whole aspect. Jesus knows that while we were yet dead in our sins, Christ came and he died for each one of us. He doesn't say, get your life together. He says, I know your life is not together. I'm here to get your life together. I'm here to help you. If you guys are navigating through some difficult marital waters, and you're having a hard time navigating through that, please call me or call Bill or call Paul. Listen carefully. Is that, is that clear? I don't want all of a sudden hear somebody saying, we're now separated, we're now divorced. We're now, hear what I mean? And move there without first talking. We all need help sometimes. We all need someone just to help us give them a different perspective. But we're not able to help and help direct. And sometimes it's die to self. Sometimes it's listen. Sometimes it's, it's, you know what I mean? Some hard things that we need to hear that's lining up with what? God's word. But I want you to know from, from us, if you're having a hard time, and we all have hard times possibly, and you're having a hard time navigating through that, then let's get together, okay? That's what we're here for. That's why we're a family. But Jesus came, and, and we have these sacraments here, and, and, you know, Jesus is our high priest. And he was tempted as we are, yet without sin. And yet the father allowed and was pleased that his son receive the consequences of your sin and my sin upon him for one reason, that we can have a relationship. Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of whom I am the chief, Paul prayed, Paul prayed. That's why God wants to have a relationship with you. And that's what we're remembering, what he's done for us. Bill, will you please pray? Father, I, I look at what, what's happened, Father. You, you, you sent your son, and on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and, and he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you for the, the forgiveness of sins, Lord. You, you, you sent your son to re restore that relationship with you, Father, to, to uh, bring us to you, Lord, so that, that we could come with, without, the, without the sin that separates us. Father, thank you for what this bread represents. Thank you for dying for us, Father, for, for loving us so much that you would give it all up, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's partake. Then he took the cup and same thing. He gave thanks and he passed it out to his disciples and he said, drink from it, all of you. He said, but this now is the blood which represents a brand new covenant that I'm making, which is going to be shed for many for the remissions of their sins. He's talking about the blood that was going to be shed at Calvary for the forgiveness of our sins, that we are now redeemed, we've been ransomed, 
We've been set free from our sins because of what Christ has done for us. And as a result, we can boldly come into the throne room of grace and find mercy and grace in what? Time of need. Thank you, Lord. Paul, will you please pray for the Jews? Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for the gift of your son, Lord. And Jesus, we do thank you for what you did on the cross. And as <clears throat> we can't imagine uh, the, the, the pain that you suffered physically, but mm -hmm. taking our sins upon you, uh, uh, Lord, we have no idea what, what that means. We have no idea what the cat cost. And we do know that it was our sins that put you there, Lord, but it was your blood. It was your blood that washed him away and made us clean that we could have eternal life and that we could have a relationship with you. We thank you for that. We praise you. Help us to remember it every day, Lord, and keep our eyes upon you. We ask through your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's partake. Father, we thank you for this time to open your word, talk and think and reflect, Lord, on, on what it means for husbands to truly care for and love their wives. Do that work, God, in each one of us, Father. We're all broken, valuable pieces, Lord, that I just want to be used for your kingdom. Bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day, guys.